Uh, good evening, everybody. We have some artists um, who are participating in Musicville joining us tonight, uh, which is very exciting. So the open call is officially over and the artists have been selected. Congratulations to everyone who's been selected and to everyone watching us online as this is being recorded and is going to be uploaded on YouTube later. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, and welcome to tonight's lecture. We call them lectures, however, I don't think it needs to be so rigid. We just don't, haven't been able to find a better word for it. Uh, but it's kind of um, a gathering, uh, a conversation and exploration of different topics that are related to uh, the project Musicville. So what is Musicville? If anyone here is not already um, up to date, it is um, a European Union uh, project, a uh, European Union funded project uh, between three countries, Croatia, Austria, and Slovenia, um, that are organizing uh, a contemporary opera in three acts, which are going to be happening in three countries in 2024. So it is a two year project that consists of various stages. Right now, we are in the um online implementation stage with uh which includes the lectures that uh you are participating in right now uh tonight's speaker is mr jay springett from london uk uh he is a writer a theorist and a strategist uh for hybrid environments uh welcome mr springett uh tonight's lecture uh topic is solar punk um a movement which you have been um, a part of since its very beginnings. So I have indeed, yeah. We're, we're very excited to hear more about uh, the movement, uh, the topics that you are um, interested in, and to see what solar punk is all about and how we can use it and implement uh, into musical as well. Cool. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. It's a pleasure to be invited. Um, let me just share my share my screen. I think my talk's about 40, 40 minutes, maybe something like that. Um, we'll see. <laughs> I haven't, I didn't practice it, so we'll see how long it lasts for. It's going to be something like that. Um, so yeah, it's really nice to be here. Um, so a bit about me is that I'm a consultant, strategist, and writer. And I have fallen um, by various ways and means into the discipline of world running, which involves world building and the process of worlding, um, which is perhaps something we could talk about in the Q&A. But I live online at the jmo.net. Um, I have a fairly popular weekly podcast called 301 Permanently Moved. Um, and I avoid Twitter these days. Um, and if you're interested, my solar punk short story in the storm of fire, which was long listed for the BSFA award for short fiction, um, can be found in the anthology and lately the sun. I've also been an admin on solarpunks.net since 2014. Um, given the audience and the goals of music bill, um, as a project, I'm not going to talk about solar punk in a way that spells out what it is for various reasons, which will become apparent in the talk. Instead, I'm going to talk, uh, my talk is instead more of an invitation to explore solar punk for yourselves. Um, and I'd like to begin with two quotes. The first is from science fiction author Madeleine Ashby, who gave us all one piece of advice, which was to talk loudly and frequently and in detail about the future that you want, because you can't manifest what you don't share. And I, um, if you only take one thing away from today's talk, I hope um, that it's that we are we are all free to imagine new worlds. And if we believe things that can be different from the way that they are today, you must share that with others. The second um, is this quote by Amir Cesar, um, which I really recently came across in Isaiah Johnson's uh, solar punk essay, Solar Punk and the Value of Utopia. A civilization that provides in excuse me, let me sell that again. A, civil a civilization that proves incapable of solving the problems it creates is a decadent civilization, 
A civilization that chooses to close its eyes to its most crucial problems is a stricken civilization, and a civilization that uses its principles for trickery and defeat is a dying civilization. Isaiah Johnson, writing about this quote, goes on to say, these words might well have been written specifically for the issue of climate change. Indeed, they were written for colonial. In, indeed, that they were written for colonialism serves to underscore the relationship between the two. Every moment that climate change is not fought with every available tool is a moment that we, namely those in the global north, are choosing convenience over justice. To confront climate change as an in inevitability, to give in to climate grief, is to renounce the cause of justice when it is the most crucial, when it is most crucially thrust upon us. While there is no silver bullet to fighting the growing nihilistic resignation of climate grief, there are good reasons to believe that solar punk is an important part of the fight. So with those two quotes in mind, let's our turn our attention to solar punk. Usually when I'm giving a talk or being interviewed about solar punk, I reach for a go-to description. But in the last 18 months, solar punk has grown in the social imagination a lot. More people than ever are at least ambiently aware of what solar punk is, or at least the term. Indeed, just the other day, Congresswoman Alexander Ocasio-Cortez was asked on an Instagram live stream about her take on climate doom, and AOC replied that she was a big believer, not just in climate optimism, but in solar punk. And for those of us who started to try and make solar punk a thing back in, 20, back in 2012, this felt, really felt like a big moment. What was once a small, close-knit com community of tumblers making lists and blogs in 2012 has become a sprawling, out-of-control idea gaining momentum in culture day by day. <coughs> Excuse me. Unfortunately, what most people think of as solar punk probably isn't. This is the current Google image search results for the term. I find it a good barometer for what culture at large probably thinks solar punk is by doing this search. Unfortunately, much of what go of what Google thinks solar punk is, isn't. It's mostly eco-modernist greenwashing images on this page. In fact, in an interview with Vice, I said that if you're looking at an eco-future image and it doesn't have people in it, then it's not solar punk. And what image did Vice use to illustrate the article? That's right, this horrendous destroy it all and build something completely different um, eco-modernist nightmare. Compare it to this one by Jeff Jessica Perlstein, a very famous image, and which, in, in your opinion, is the most solar punk? This one or this one? A solar punk future is always one with people in it. My usual line is that solar punk is a movement in art, fashion, technology, and activism that seeks to answer and embody the question, what does a su sustainable civilization look like and how can we get there? Perhaps better, solar punk is about being en route to a better world. Solar punk is not nihilistic like cyberpunk, and it's not quasi-reactionary like steampunk. It attempts to imagine the solutions to live comfortably without fossil fuels, to equitably, equitably manage scarcity and share abundance, to be kinder to each other and to the planet that we share. It is once a vision of the future, a thoughtful provocation and an achievable lifestyle. In 2016, solarpunkanarchist.com wrote the essay, What is Solar Punk? and described it as practical utopianism, an eco-futurist movement which tries to think our way out of catastrophe by imagining a future most people would actually like to live in instead of the ones that we should be trying to avoid. Echoing this, fittingly given the audience, I've previously called Solar Punk a grand dress rehearsal for the future that we would like to live in, told through story, dreams, and song inspired by practical developments in interventions in the world that exist today. I will turn again to this thought, um, but I'd like to talk a little about solar punk's history and where we find ourselves. Back in 2014, the EIA, CIA and World Bank published a graph charting the falling cost of solar energy and titled it, Welcome to the Terror Dome. But solar punk doesn't see terror in this future. We, um, or I mean the early solar punks on, on Tumblr, certainly didn't. If cyberpunk in the 1980s was about imagine, imagining the coming societal impact of the technological shift towards microchips and computers, then solarpunk is tied to the drastic technological shift towards renewables and the decentralization 
that empowers movements for social justice and economic lib liberation that it may bring with it. The solar in solar punk is, of course, uh, of course, refers to solar as in power. Solar punk sees infrastructure as a site of potential resistance. In 2014, the, the late mayor of Jacksonville, Mississippi, uh, Chokwe Lumumba, said that dealing with infrastructure is a protection against being robbed of one's self-determination. Another important foundational element to solar punk was, and still is, the feeling that the present is broken and that we are caught in the extreme present that is found in um, Schumann Bashir's book, Emotional Capitalism. The present is either too slow, full of inertia, unable to process or engage with the fast-moving crisis crises that we face, or the present is too fast and we can't look further than our own noses, or perhaps an iPhone screen. The recent IPCC report gave us until 2035 to turn the present around. Back in the early 2010s, we felt that the, the visions of the future that we all shared in our collective imagination were actually someone else's, not our own. And since then, things have only gotten worse. The recent AAA uh, game Cyberpunk 2077 is still selling us the same idea of the future that we had, nearly, which is nearly 40 years old. Mark Fisher wrote in Ghosts of My Life in 2014 that it doesn't feel like the future, or alternatively, it doesn't feel as if the 21st century has started yet. We remain trapped in the 20th century. The, so it's the slow cancellation of the future has been accompanied by deflation of expectations. Around the time that Fisher wrote these words, it was when I joined solarpunks.net um, with a bunch of other people also trying to think about futures plural in new ways. In 2012, Adam Flynn had written the first essay on solarpunks uh, entitled On the Need for, for New Futures. And he wrote that we are starved for visions of the future that will sustain us and give us something to hope for. Ideas of life beyond the rusted chrome of yes tomorrow or nightmare realms of radiated men, flesh eat, uh, men eating the flesh of other radiated men. He echoes, I think, Fisher's, Fisher's lament. According to filmstories.com, as of yesterday, there are currently 137 reboots, remakes, and sequels in various phases of production. We are stuck in a steady state cultural imagination. And due to copyright, our culture treats narratives, myth, and our shared social imagination as a commodity. The stories that influence our imagination are things to be bought and sold. Mass culture, I believe, runs on what I call cultural grammars, which are essentially shared expectations. And new cultural products made by the entertainment industry have to reference something from a time when everyone shared mass culture and shared those grammars to continue making money, um, which is when their business model still worked. So before the Internet, basically. Disney recently spent $200 million on a film based on a ride. And the biggest film of the summer is based on a toy from the 1950s. This movie represents the current denouement of a phenomenon that I call cultural fracking, a process of extracting new value out of sedimentary layers of meaning that comprise mass culture from the past. In order to profitably mine the stable expectations of the wider cultural imagination, mainstream culture has to continually frack the past to create future material. It's not that all the reboots, remakes, and nostalgic mashups like Ready Player One are unoriginal. It's just the logic of media produced under a narrative monopoly. Let's quickly look at, take a tour through the kinds of visions of the future that we are currently being sold, or still are being sold. There's 2001 Space Realism, which you can see in Ad Astra and Interstellar. Or well, there's retro futures like Tomorrowland that bring uh, the borrow from the 1950s. It's Lost in Space and uh, the Jetsons. Sometimes, like in Fallout, there's a retro 50s future, is remixed with post-apocalyptic post fears and the Cold War. Or straight-up post-apocalyptic movies are rebooted to reference ecological collapse instead of fears about peak oil. And then, of course, there's Disney's MCU, or Star Wars, take your slide, <laughs> um, which is filled with characters created more than half a century ago. It's undeniable that Disney is fracking every last penny from its $4.2 billion purchase of the commodity known as Marvel. Consider the types of stories that they are selling. In a time of collective action needed on climate change, biosphere collapse, mass migration, and other global scale challenges, we are getting narratives of individual superheroes or saviors. Stories about figures that are above or beyond humanity coming to save the day. 
In the real world, of course, no one is coming. And this hasn't gone unseen. Alan Moore said in an interview back in 2014 that, his, to, that to his mind, this embracing of what were unambiguously children's characters in their mid 20th century inception seems to indicate a retreat from the admittedly, the admittedly overwhelming complexities of modern existence. So solar punk is a collective attempt to think beyond the, co the, the cultural condition that Fisher diagnosed as capitalist realism. The, the widespread sense that it's not only is capitalism the only viable political and economic system, but also that it is now impossible to imagine a coherent alternative to it. The stories that we tell shape the stories that we tell shape and define our desires. Late capitalism's urge to control desire is one of the ways in which it defutures our imaginations. I personally believe that defuturing has contributed greatly to the meaning crisis that we now find ourselves in, a civilization that chooses to close its eyes to its most crucial problems, trapping us within a steady state cultural imagination. A decade ago, I felt that it was punk as hell to imagine a better world beyond all this, and I still feel the same way. In the early 2010s, all the sci-fi was about the end of the world, floods, freezes, and intrepid movie stars going to space to stop an asteroid. But as I said, no one is actually coming to save us. So I am a solar punk because the only other options are denial or despair. I've been, in the, I've been an environmental activist um, for most of my life. Uh, I was planting trees, collecting cans, and picking up litter in my primary school in the mid-90s when I was about 10. Um, and I've occupied spaces and I've been beaten by riot police. But I got too old for that in my 20s. And like many activists, I went through a period of grief for the whole world. And as the Dark Mountain Manifesto says, climate change brings home at last our ultimate powerlessness, or at least the feeling of such. Solar punk, and in my involvement with it, is a response to the complicated relationship that I've always seen between climate change, sustainability, politics and art. My friend Dougal Hine and Dark Mountain Manifesto co-author recently wrote a book called Outwork in the Ruins, in which he said, when it, comes, when it comes to what to do about climate change, responsibility passes from the scientists to the engineers and the economists. Artists are brought in onto projects about climate change. The assumption tends to be that they will make something that helps deliver the message, a poem, a play, a film, a pop song. It will wake people up to the depth of the trouble that we are, we are in. It will stir people into action about um, and bring about beh behavior change, which is what is kind of so exciting and heartening about the wider Musicville project. Um, it isn't about you know answers or the steering behavioral change or getting out the message. Um, it's not art as a marketing function, um, which is something that art should never have been asked a role that art should never have been asked to play in the first place. Um, music bill is certainly in the spirit of solar punk which begs the question what shall we do during the pandemic the writer and academic Sidia Hartman said that so much of the work of oppression is about policing the imagination and solar punk's role in culture is in some sense to provide a space and perhaps the permission for those of you who wish to think past the defuturing tendencies of capitalist realism and the cultural predicament that we find ourselves in in 2011, cyberpunk author Neil Stevenson proposed the fictional, that fictional versions of the future act as hieroglyphs, simple, recognizable series, symbols on whose significance we can all agree upon. Stevenson later teamed up with Arizona State University to create Project Hieroglyph, an attempt to crowdsource ideas and symbols to punctuate our malaise. Contributing to the project in 2014, Adam Flynn wrote the important essay, Solar Punk, Notes Towards a Manifesto. Solar Punk, he thought, could be a bigger idea that does more than just act as a symbol. We need big futures in new directions, towards things beyond cool toys for rich people. We are trying to make Solar Punk a concept, an aesthetic, a design fiction movement, a setting for role-playing games, because we need banners to rally around and there is power in forming subcultures around ideas. Excuse me. Drawing inspiration from Ursula K. Le Guin's carrier bag theory of fiction, Solopunk asks, what if we collectively, together, <clears throat> create a, a container 
that could be used by anyone to place their ideas about the future inside of? And what sort of stories could, could that container with the things it contains create? Sorry if that was a bit wordy. Solarpunk emerged on social networks and it has found its place in culture both in and on them. Like Musicville, Solarpunk is also made up of separate communities of people working, collaborating, making art and music alongside each other. And, it, and, the, and the, the wider movement and community is noisy and vibrant. One of the results of this network creation, due to the way social networks work, is that Solarpunk has become what I recently called in an essay, a container. A container that is at all at once an idea, a hashtag, a concept, a place to put ideas into. You can post to the Solarpunk hashtag but you can also click on it. And because of the nature of the feed, solarpunk ideas are always in juxtaposition next to one another. Think about clicking beyond the Google image search from the beginning I showed you and falling into solarpunk Tumblr or solarpunk Reddit. Beyond that front page, with no pe uh, beyond that page of photos uh, of, of images with no people in, you'll find an image of a lean-to greenhouse next to a post on appropriate technology for water harvesting, alongside a rendered uh, rendering of a retrofitted suburbia, another article about solar panels, another about e-bikes, et cetera, et cetera. At its core, Solarpunk is about placing ideas in relation to one another, a process of bricolage, inspiring people to create polyphonic future textures. For a lot of people, shorthand is shorthand for an aesthetic. Many teenagers use aesthetic as an all-purpose adjective. That's so aesthetic as a shorthand for that is so aesthetically pleasing to me. But in a broader internet parlance, it now, collect, it now means a collection of signifiers, or more precisely, a vibe. What emerges from solar punk's bricolage is a vibe. It's what the feeling, it's, it's the feeling, it, what does the, what does, the vibe is the feeling of the future, or rather, what does the future feel like? Writing in 2015, speculative fiction writer Andrew Della Hudson um, noted that solarpunk needs to escape clear definition. What is solarpunk? I hesitate to define it and therefore limit it for the thousands now exploring its possibilities, which is why I too, still in 2023, am dancing around the subject of what solarpunk is. But the first anthology was published in Brazilian Portuguese in 2012 ecological and fantastical stories in a sustainable world. And this book was part of a series, Atom Punk and Diesel Punk Followed. It was later translated into English after a successful Kickstarter a few years later. Simply by their names, these punks reserved a space at the table alongside other punk genres. Most people, upon encountering the term solar punk, of course, make the comparison to its grandfather, cyberpunk. Nearly 40 years on from its inception, it too has an aesthetic and a vibe. Heavy rain and harsh neon, cool robot limbs and VR goggles. The genre's big symbols, like cyberpunk and the metaverse, have transcended their roles as symbolic warnings and have become prophecies. So what was cyberpunk, what was cyberpunk originally about? It was about the way that technology shoves human life into ever greater levels of abstraction, like cyberspace. It was about the rise of corporate power and ubiqu ubiquitous computation and greed. It was about the politics of the 1980s, urban decay and globalization, the rise of zero tolerance policing, anxieties around healthcare and the psychological toll of the cold forever war and the possibility of nuclear annihilation. It was also about the rise of the microchip and computers. But today, things are far, far worse and we've almost arrived at some of these imagined futures. Solarpunk tries to contrast the popular grim futures of cyberpunk with a bright viridian green optimism. Excuse me. A response to Sesman and Boyer's call to map out other ways of being, behaving and belonging in relation to energy in order to, to reimagine modernity in the face of global warming. As computing was integral to the politics of, so of cyberpunk, in solarpunk, energy is explicitly political, and the unfolding process that renewables provide, transmutation of wind, water, and power, when projected forwards, result in new possible human life ways that we can think about. To return to some graphs, 
we have all seen this one or variants of it. The global temperature rise since 1850 and its ominous rise to the right. But there, is, but there's also this one, another hockey stick um, of a very different kind. The cost of solar since 1975 on the left, and the total global solar panel installations on the right. Solar punk, sorry, solar punks. Solar panels like microchips are a semiconductor technology, and the cost will continue to fall. And their production in, and in this installation, uh, and the production and installation of them will continue to rise. Welcome to the Terradome. Frederick Jameson observed back in 1982 that the role of science fiction is not to imagine the future so much to as defamiliarize and restructure our experience of our own present and to do so in specific ways. Cyberpunk's foundational text held a deeply cynical view of the future alongside a call for resistance. But as the genre and its aesthetic trappings are created, its politics were worn away by its cultural passage leaving what we have today, which is just an aesthetic vibe and a setting for bug buggy video games. So what then is Solarpunk about right now? It's about finding ways to make life more wonderful and more importantly for the generations that follow us, i.e. extending human life at a species level rather than individually. And imagine permaculturalists thinking about cathedral time. Solarpunk's juxtaposition and bricolage that I mentioned can be seen as far back as 2014. As Flynn wrote, as it stands, is a mashup of the following, 1800s age of sale, frontier living, but with more bicycles, creative reuse of existing infrastructure, so, um, sometimes post-apocalyptic, sometimes present weird, Juilliard style innovation from the developing world, high-tech backends with simple, elegant outputs. It can also be seen in Miss in, in Tumblr user at Miss Olivia Louise's massively viral foundational post on Solarpunk from the same year. Natural colors, Art Nouveau, handcrafted wares, tailors and dressmakers, streetcars, airships, stained glass window, uh, stained glass window solar panels, education in tech and food growing, solar rooftops and roadways, communal greenhouses, renewable energy powered Art Nouveau style tech life. In both posts, you can see a rearrangement of past, present, and future, placing one thing up against another. But it's important to note that it's not the Art Nouveau itself that makes it solar punk. Because if Art Nouveau references become an aesthetic shorthand for utopian future, they'll become another consumable trope for the wealthy to, to cling to. Solar punk will not and cannot mean one thing, no matter how memified it becomes, for it is ever open for adoption and appropriation. It's this constant spawning of new worlds and new futures that keeps solar punk um, fuzzy edged, always in the process of renewal. And without renewal, solar punk is always in danger of boxing itself in. Solar punk is the here and now, and it's a texture of things that already exist in the world, but projected forward. A food forest on every street, an opera in every public park, and a water filter and a solar panel on every home. Solarpunk is about finding ourselves in time, too. As Flynn observed back in 2012, one of the most curious facts about living as we do today is that our future does not exist, strictly speaking, exist. Our philosophy of history has become more, more or less collapsed. We are confronted with a dizzying array of signals, strong, weak, and fair, and foul. And it's Solarpunk's polyphon um, poly polyphonic thinking uh, which means that it's not necessarily sequential, which is why it's, uh, it issues like an official canon of solar punk. And I, because I often struggle to point people towards a single book or a novel and say that's solar punk. Instead, there's dozens of anthologies. And I actually gave up updating the slide several years ago because I ran out of room. Um, and what's important about the short story collection and its relationship to solar punk is that each book contains multiple voices and multiple visions of the future with each story and each point of view in juxtaposition with one another each story adding to the texture each book um, in turn contributing towards the vibe of what futures that we might encounter or step into writing on solar punk um, in the open library of humanities in 2019 
Reese Williams observed that solar punk as a uh, also observed solar punk as a container. Unusually, conceptual space named solar punk emerged prior to the narratives that are now gradually given its substance. As much as solar punk happens outside the published stories, solar punk is a world first and a set of narratives second. Throwing inspiration from Williams' use of the word world, and also perhaps we could substitute it for a container, the word container, we can reframe solar punk as an, an, an exercise in collective world building. Not a single, single shared world, but multiple worlds. Because as writer, researcher, and foresight practitioner Paul Graham Raven says, the way you think about worlds you build is reflected in the way that you narrate them. Or to restate this with a quote from Vanessa, De um, Vanessa Andriotti's fantastic 2021 20, book, Hospicing Modernity, stories are not hum uh, human-made tools of communication that aim to index the world into language, or the word, uh, or to word the world. Instead, stories are entities that visit and move things in the world in non-linear time. They are stories that world the world. To face the cha challenges that civilization faces, we must look to the past as well as the future. There is so much good work happening in the world to decolonize and retextualize and, you know, resituate history but also to restore and repair environments, et cetera. Um, but solar punk attempts to retell the narratives that we tell ourselves about the past in the present and about the future. And it tries to provide space for indigenous sovereignties, reproductive justice, radical politics. Um, it's also about recasting old ideas alongside the contemporary and projecting their arrangement forward, as I keep saying, uh, for, um, for better or for worse. Cory Doctorow, echoing Jameson, said that science fiction isn't predictive of the future. It tends to be about diagnosing our current aspirations and anxieties. So solar punk is also about the speculative present. It tries to create a new experience of the world with all the possibilities that exist in it today and pushing them forwards by pushing the forwards, and then it brings those possibilities from the future stories back into the present. So you have this loop. Solar punks and people inspired by it find themselves walking down the street with a head with a head full of concepts from from the uh, juxtaposition and bricolage that I mentioned earlier, permacultural techniques and urban planning, ideas for festivals, stories, and songs. The speculative present is wondering why the local piece of scrubland next to the supermarket car park is underutilized as a space for food production. And it's also being able to imagine the next, the dead grass next to the train station as a site for rewilding. Both are sites for both, uh, both are sites for real and narrative possibility. If you can tell a story about it, then something can happen. The world around us right now provides a rich story of idea, a rich soil of ideas and action from which our struggles on route to a better world can grow. Kerry Facer uses a similar term called the thick present, where she says the ideas of the future shape what is experienced in the present, and the experience of the present shapes ideas about the past, and the rereading of the past forms ideas of future possibility. One of Solopunk's maxims is to move quietly and plant things, to engage in activities in the margins. This is something that I want, um, or I would like the participants of Musicville to think about. Um, what does it mean to move quietly and plant things? What can be done in the margins? And what gestures can we make together now, today, that may start small but grow into mighty oaks? And I'd like to introduce you to a term from the animist thinker and writer, Gordon White. The Anthropogreen, a term in direct opposition to the doom attitude of the Anthropocene, so beloved of the art world in recent years. A new geological approach defined by the outcome of a different sort of human intervention upon the earth. A civilization shaped by small gestures made with gardener's hands. Because here's the thing, and this can be quite surprising, but if you plant a tree, or hundreds or thousands of them, they grow. Life unfolds. It's all very well 
of us as a society to say that we need to plant billions of trees. But once they are in the ground, then what? We have a partnership with these um, with these trees, um, with the more than human world. And so there is a journey. So thus begins, after planting a tree, a journey that we take together. One of the hallmarks of our civilization being incapable of solving the problems that we face is the deficiency of long-term thinking. Our modern world attempts to focus us towards the short-term and quarterly growth. But in the real world, away from high-frequency trading, it takes 100 to 120 years for an oak tree to grow from full seed to full canopy height. That's three human generations. This is real growth, and I'd like to propose that everything that occurs in the duration between the decision to plant an acorn to a full-grown oak crown is short-term thinking in the context of the Anthropogreen. Whether it be trees or cultural ideas, like solar punk that was sown a decade ago, Ideas and gestures that we make today need time to grow. And what happens to the trees planted today, and what will happen to the trees that we plant today that grow alongside humanity? Both tree and person are en route to a better world. In the real world of climate, weather, trees, and culture, away from finance and spreadsheets, a date of 2150 seems like the medium term. Progress and development is not the same as growth, and it's an integral thesis of solar punk, which should be about decoupling the first from the second. More is not better. Solar punk is punk because optimism and the practical routes forward are very much not in vogue culturally or currently are part of the status quo. The king of limbs in Britain is over a thousand years old. It has been growing quietly in place since before the Norman conquests. Millennia-long timescales of engagement with the world around us are almost unimaginable when contrasted with two-week-long agile sprints in the tech world or the popular four years of a governance cycle. And I'm not suggesting that we try and make stories and art that will last for a thousand years, but instead we should be making art, but that instead we should be making art and music and poetry and songs to ensure that we continue to do so for the next thousand years. It isn't about getting out the message. It's about the messages that we choose to send person to person embedded in culture into the future. And the clearest message is planting a tree. Solar punk, therefore, is a dress rehearsal, not just for one future, but many and possible futures. Your street, back garden or apartment all become real world sites for a story. Solar punk is both play and a play about all the things that we may do en route to a better future. To return again to Madeleine Ashby, you can't manifest what you don't share. It is in discussing the future loudly and in detail that we can test and prototype our ideas for a better futures while still asking the question, better future for whom? Writer and theorist Paul Graham Raven, who I've already mentioned, in his essay, Ways of Telling Tomorrows, makes the case for the utility of science fiction to reconcile historical trajectories with extrapolated trends, to act as storehouses for tools and strategies for potential futures. Speculative presents and the speculative futures that they may lead to provide a sandbox today where all of these ideas and solutions might be tested to destruction without consequence. By reinterpreting the present, we can test our ideas about the future. In 2018, comics writer and author Warren Ellis introduced me to the term refuturing. Just as rewilding is to landscape, refuturing is to the imagination. The sense of creating new immediate futures and repopulating the future space with something entirely divorced from the previous consensus futures. If futuring is, if futuring is shape the possibility space for action, to refuture is to encourage and cultivate the qualities of futuring in the minds of people who encounter solar pump. The creation of speculative presence allows us to resist the defuturing processes of steady state capitalist realism by the generation of plausible new worlds. Some of these plausible worlds can be found in solar pump, which is what I call a mimetic engine which I'm going to define rather than solar punk itself. 
Mimetic engines are ideas for producing more ideas, a narrative space that appeals to people's better selves. Mimetic engines are always asking, um, are always questions asking for better answers. It is an engine that powers the refuturing of its participants' imaginations. Those answers can undergo reformation and disruption without changing the question. And those ideas must affect the world beyond the boundaries of its container. So the idea, so that the idea must have impact in the real world in some sense. And it is my belief that we can feel our way out of the mess of the early 21st century by the creation of generous mimetic engines that are about giving more possibility back into the world and into culture than they closed down. To return to the question, what should we do? Given the nature of the Musicville project, I wanted to close my talk with a question that I'm often asked. What does solar punk music sound like? Given everything I've said about it being a container for ideas, it being a sandbox for testing things, imagining new worlds, a space to play and think about the future, it strikes me that this is the wrong sort of question. Instead, the question should be, what sort of music do solar punks make? This question, reframed in this way, is much better, is a much bigger question that is full of more possibilities. What solar punks? What kind of futures are they making music in? And what kind of opera, art, theatre are the solar punks making? One is tempted to say that the sort of music that solar punks make is like the music that people have always made, a coming together of people in community to make something living. Solar punks will probably sing together, dance together, play instruments, and stand on stages in town squares at festivals and celebrations. So, Solar punks may make folk music. Which folk songs do we sing today that we will which folk songs do, that we sing today will still be sung in 2150? And why will we be singing them? But also, what small gestures and what songs can we write today about the trees and the land and the people concerned with challenges en route to the better world that might still be sung tomorrow? I don't know what solar punk music sounds like, but I can imagine that this is the sort of music that solar punks make. Coming to the end, as I said, solar punk is a grand dress rehearsal, a concept, an idea, a container that's free to, for everyone to put ideas into and see what comes out again. A mimetic engine, an imaginary solar punk future, yours and mine, this should be considered a rehearsal for the future that we would like to live in. Solarpunk tries um, to put new features into the minds of individuals, um, but it also has been creating inspiring communities in real life to DIY their own better features into, an exist uh, into existence from bottom up, um, which we can talk about in the Q&A. Writing in the LARB in 2018, Reese Williams wrote the following of Solarpunk. Solarpunk is better characterized as a kaleidoscopic manifesto, an argument in story and image, the song of a, com a community both incohate and coalescing, simultaneously committed to and finding its feet. There's no guarantee that this will lead anywhere, that it will, that it will grow and thrive or influence culture and thinking as a whole. But the solarpunk community and its stance make up a positive force in the current struggle. Here's to the light. Speaking last year, during the pan, uh, maybe it was a year before actually, during the pandemic, Arundhati Roy was asked what lies ahead, and she said, reimagining a world, only that. Thanks very much. Um, I think that's given you a lot to think about as the project evolves. Let me stop sharing. There you go. Mr. Springy, thank you so much for this very inspiring talk. And there's so many, um, so much information and so many resources that I feel like our participants and the audience are uh, inclined to read about and look at. Um, is there an online resource uh, of um, the stories and the books that you mentioned that we can visit? Uh, is there any maybe free resources that are available to the public? Yeah, 
Um, you can. The best place to start is well, actually, it depends. What's your favorite social network? Is it Reddit? Is it is it Tumblr? You know, all you have to do is type Solarpunk and click on the hashtag and see what people are saying. Twitter isn't a great place to do that these days, but all the other all the other places are fine. Um, they each each of those communities have their own thing going on, you know, about what they're talking about, both practical and imaginary. In addition to that, um, you can just search Solar Punk in wherever you get your books from, and you can find the anthologies and so on and so forth. Um, Solar Punk magazine has recently started um, last year, two years ago. That's a quarterly um, magazine of Solar Punk fiction, um, and they're committed to publishing. Um, some of at least one story in translation every every issue, which I think is speaks to like the um, the commitment to you know different voices and so on and so forth because it's extremely expensive to to publish stuff in translation that's for sure. Um, so yeah, it really depends on where you are on the internet because you can find Solarpunk there now, um, which of course was very different ten years ago in the early days of Solarpunk when um, as I was reminding some students the other week in 2014 especially there was no optimistic sci-fi there was no stories about it, about climate change that weren't doom and gloom um and it was and now in 2023 there's a big enough market that you can sustain anthologies and magazines and you know it's 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 very encouraging to, to have seen how much it's grown Yes, that is very, very uh, exciting and inspiring, um, especially for me personally, since I must admit I haven't had much connection with solar punk or the stories before, but I'm very much inclined to really dive into it now. Uh, so I would like to open this uh, Q&A section of the lecture um, selfishly with my own question. And anyone Bear with me else? one second. It's stopped raining. Oh. I simply must open the window. It's boiling in here. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I'm not getting wet anymore. That's how that's how we know that climate change indeed is happening since September in England is boiling inside. <laughs> um, so yeah, exactly. anyone anyone who is today. no. Anyone who uh, would like to participate in the Q&A section, uh, feel free to uh, use the raise hand uh, option, uh, just so there is no talking over people. Uh, but my question is, so uh, as I was listening to the lecture, I was thinking about how uh, 10 to 12 years of being involved in a, in a movement or in a project is a very long time. Um, and since your uh, story was published in 2012, am I correct? No, the, no my story my story was um, 2020 mm -hmm. um, story. The, fir the very first solar punk story was published in 2014, mm -hmm. which you can find in the free Everything Change anthology. It was published by um, the ASU. Um, oh, OK. Um, yeah. So we're really coming but... up on 10 years in the first story. <laughs> Um, but I was thinking about how 10 years is, um, in a grand scheme of things, is not a, a, a long time. However, in a lifetime, it is. Um, so 10 years ago, let's say, or 15 years ago, um, you must have had some sort of um, a, a picture of a future that you were either hoping for or advocating for. So now that we're in 2023, having lived through many many things a pandemic and all these um inevitable social and uh political changes um how does the present which used to be the future fare uh, to what you had envisioned 10 years ago it's a good question um one of the biggest or most important sort of climate cultural climate change related things in my life was the Dark Mountain Project or the, and the Dark Mountain Manifesto written by Dougald Hine and um, Paul Kingsnorth, which I believe was 2009. Um, 2008 had been the last climate camp that I'd attended here in the UK 
um, which was the occupations of the Drax power station, or no, King's North power, power station, I should say. Um, and all around me, my friends and colleagues were, you know, everyone was burning themselves out. And that was something that um, climate grief, I suppose, is, is something that the Dark Mountain movement addressed. Um, and at the time, of course, they were called doomers. <laughs> and, you know, um, and, and, and were somewhat ostracized, you know, saying people that they'd given up. When actually, you know, the movement was actually about coming to terms with what's happening and figuring out ways of living in the world, given that we know that there are certain things that are now inevitable, you know. Um, and it's interesting, specifically in the UK, to see the Extinction Rebellion going through the same mental process nearly 15 years after the Dark Mountain, you know, uh, the Dark Mountain movement. And it was during the Dark Mountain period that, I guess, Solarpunk in 2012 came to my attention, you know. And it really was just a word on a mailing list, Solarpunk. And as soon as I heard the word, I knew what it was, and I knew what it meant, and I knew what stories it had, and I knew the, what the, what art was going to get made, and the, you know, it, it, everything just from the one word, you know. So as was cyberpunk, so is solarpunk, and and after that, it was you know we were all, we were all collectively <laughs> off to the races, as it were, um, which is why so people just started talking about it. What is solarpunk? Um, you can go and have a look at the uh, some of Adam Flynn's early essays, like on the need for new futures, and m much of it still holds up. We still need new futures, you know. Um, but the difference is that Solarpunk exists now, and it didn't then. It was just an idea. Um, and in terms of my own life, Solarpunk being about en route en route to a better world. Like what are the po politics of solar punk? In fact, I saw a really good Reddit post today that was, is solar punk communist, Marxist, socialist, anarchist? And the top most replied thing was yes, <laughs> because it's a container. You can put whatever ideas you want into it and, you know, you can take and then you can, you know, see what comes out. So I like the ambiguity of that. Um, and the ambiguity somewhat isolates or protects it from, from what happened to cyberpunk, where its politics were lost. Um, by having a space for politics inside of it, always, um, hopefully it's it's a it's different from from people rejecting the politics and, and just using the, the cool vibe. Um, but yeah, it's really encouraging. It's very bizarre to be teaching students who are 18. And for them, solar punk has always been a thing. It's always existed. Um, yeah, so it's encouraging. It's cool. Uh, I just want to make a short comment on the last thing that you said, because I first heard of the term from a 13 year old teenager, from a 13 year old girl. Uh, and apparently solar punk is really trending on TikTok in the last couple of years, quite a lot. And it's become really a thing, you know, that um kind of young people that are aware of certain issues are very much following in this sense so mm -hmm. it's not really a question it's more of a observation so yeah one of the I things that i didn't say in my talk um about solar punk being a grand dress rehearsal is that you can't larp being a solar punk you know there's no role playing like if you want to be a solar punk you just go plant a garden or have a you know or have have a window box, do what, do whatever it is that you can, you know, you can be a solar punk by getting involved in a community group or what, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, and I think that that's quite appealing rather than, you know, the LARP or dressing up as a cyberpunk. And I don't know if you've seen those nineties images of people in like their matrix leather jackets with, <laughs> with their massive computers and stuff. Yeah. It's different. It's yeah, it's cool. I'm really glad. I didn't know that. Um, I'm not on TikTok at all, as you can imagine. Um, but yeah, that's very cool to hear. Uh, I have, I, I would actually like to hear your comment on 
uh, you mentioned earlier during your your lecture uh, that uh, uh, whenever we talk of an aesthetic or a vibe, we are in danger of a process of a commodification in a sense that uh, that it becomes an image that is essentially selling. And uh, I mean, my personal opinion is if that's gonna if uh, if so if something called solar punk is cool among is cool among kids and is gonna contribute to people planting more stuff or uh, uh, using more renewable energy, then why not? Of course, but uh, I would just like to hear your thoughts because I think. It's, in a lot, a lot of these ideas, once they become trending, uh, then you are at the risk of missing the point, if I may say so. Yeah, no, I agree. And this is um, one of the car solar punk has been criticised from day one by many people. <laughs> and the, this is actually one of the current criticisms of solar punk that you see is like the the appropriation of of solar punk as an aesthetic or as like via via brands or you know whatever, like the Chibani advert. Um, is like a, 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 a big point of discussion. However, I personally am a little more relaxed about it because the aesthetics or the imagery that you see in solar punk arises from praxis or action as opposed to you know some imagined neon future that you have in cyberpunk. Like... A walkable city with bicycles and e-bikes and delivery, you know, and deliver and delivery e-bikes and you know fruit trees on the corner and um, community gardens. Solarpunk looks that way because it's the things that we need to do, you know, um, and like the the or the some in some solarpunk art, for example, that you you see trees in in concentric rings on the hills and so on and so forth, or in, in contour. Um, and the trees look that way in solar punk art because that's based on key line design and it's what we have to do you know what i mean so so in some part some part of me that is like is mixed and relaxed because if you know the question is would be an interesting solar punk story if megacorp making drones has a solar punk campus in silicon valley you know with ponds and fruit trees and so on and so forth is that a cyberpunk story or is it a solar punk story? It depends. Uh, I, I guess the answer would be it depends uh, what class of people is using them <laughs> that campus. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, it depends uh, on who the story is about. But yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because if we're yeah. talking about yeah, because if we're talking about the same ten percent, then <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, the visual aesthetic of solar punk, I think, is the. Is, is, is the thing that I'm least worried about just because of that, mm. like the, solar punk looks a certain way because it's the things that we need to do. Um, so I'm less worried about that being used in advertising and so on and so forth, you know, like all the co-option of that, but it's certainly like the solar punk's attitude towards the future um, and towards holding space for other people and other voices and you know, making sure that everyone has their own view of what the future should be, as Madeline Ashby says, you know, we should, we need to talk loudly and in detail about it with each other. Um, I think it would be a great shame if somehow that was lost. If anyone else has any questions, feel free to raise your hand or just unmute and join the conversation. Uh, or type them in the chat if you don't want to speak. Yeah, that's also uh, a valid option. Um, now that uh, Sara and you have mentioned the class of people involved in kind of um, the greater solar punk movement, so to say, I have to mention, because I'm quite up to date with um, pop news and pop culture and uh, relevant topics. Um, I'm curious to, this has nothing to do with Music Bell as a project, but I'm curious on a personal level to hear your comment about the recent Burning Man uh, situation with people 
attending the festival that have been stuck in the desert uh, for, I don't know how long, a week longer than they wanted to. And seeing as their politic kind of is leave no trace and um, building a, a new civilization without capitalistic agenda and without money and without you know, just sharing resources, it has kind of kind of sidetracked from that. Um, do you do you think that that's just human nature or is it something else that that's making uh, these kind of events and um, people steer away from their original idea? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I was talking with some people who are, who are part of the Bureau of Land Management organizing um, team for Burning Man and who are all volunteers. And even in the best years, they're there for a third of a year so the, before the festival and after it, you know, leaving no trace. It's a, you know, there's a lot of volunteers that pick up litter. And as far as they, and they have always had contingencies about rain and so on and so forth because it's rained before. And they know, you know, it's just the worst rain that they've had. Um, and they're, you know, they're prepared to leave no trace. They're going to be there for months, picking it all up after everyone's gone home, you know. Um, but to your wider question, it's interesting. I'd like to, I'd like to hear what people have to say about what it was like, you know, once ever, because there's still people there now, you know, they're not, everyone's not out, not, not all out. Um, because in the early days of solar punk, or even now, there is, I mean, there's going to be 100 million climate refugees in the next 50 years. And even just saying those numbers out loud is, is like, you know, gives me chills. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people. And, and some part of me wants those climate camps, and they will be climate camps. You know, they're not going to be pleasant, but I want them to be like Burning Man rather than UN tents, tent cities where everyone's miserable. Um, like, could Burning Man be the model? But maybe I'm too optimistic. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, um, and yeah, there's always that sense. There's quite a few solar punk short stories where where those kind of like disaster camps feel like Burning Man as places. You know, there's food trucks and you know all sorts of amazing things going on. Um, but to actually answer your question, I think it's just in the inevitable nature of the way that 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 culture and society works that people will want to go to a place like go to a thing like Burning Man. You know. Perhaps its heyday was 2012, <laughs> before the super rich started going. But yeah, I, I don't know. I just wanted to comment that I just Googled the entrance ticket for Burning Man and it starts from $300. So I yeah. think that answers a lot of our questions, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely. I, I mean, as long as... You, uh, the thing is, I, I mean, me personally, I'm always kind of very skeptical towards these uh, kind of imagining new models of societies for the super rich that can afford that. I, okay, right? But as you said, we're going to have 100 million climate refugees pretty soon. So, Yeah. And how do they, how, how is it going to work? Mm -hmm. You know, like, like as soon as you, as soon as you start, even narratively, as soon as you start pulling on that thread, where where do the people go and what happens to them where they get to wherever it is that they need to go given you know the the migration policies that we currently have in place like um i mean god knows what southern europe is going to do <laughs> you know yeah well, like, we live there so <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah here. exactly you know, so. when, when you know when yeah. there's 100x the boats but you know there's so many things that need addressing that like are really important to think about in the future you know, from for my own part, like the, the fact that, you know, um, refugee camps, like the, if you're a refugee in the 20th century, you should be expected to be in place for 60 years, which is where some of the Palestinians still are. You know, there's still people in camps. Um, so it's like the, the average is 60 years for, for how long that you end up or can end up in a, in a refugee camp. So... Um, which is just going to be unviable in a, in a climate changed future, you know, like these places need to become new centers of economic activity. People need jobs. People need to be able to work. You know, it's a, 
it's a whole reimagining you know that's a future right there is just imagining what happens when it's in your in you what happens when and there's a new city next door to your city you know or in tomorrow yeah. yeah exactly you know tomorrow yeah. what happens if seventy thousand people show up yeah i think uh our country is starting to uh quite uh, is slowly finding it in that situation and I have to say, I, uh, I'll stop here because this this conversation will then dive directly into politics. But uh, uh, I, I mean, coming from Croatia, I see a huge difference in the last ten years. First, uh, first, you never heard any, anybody speaking Goa, practically any foreign language, fifteen years ago, even in the center of Zagreb. Then came tourists, and now you, and then came a mixture of refugees and also uh economic migrants right and uh, this is and this is something that uh uh this is something that uh, our society is completely unprepared you're in the uk yeah. the situation is a, is a bit different there but this is something that uh and it's constantly not being addressed it's always just being the problem is being skipped right but yeah. at one point it can't be so yeah which and, is in part like Solopont's role mm -hmm. is to allow people to talk about and imagine those futures, you know, like, you know, it, like I said about it, giving people permission, you know, to, and like you might, like if you personally talk about or imagine what we should do about that particular scenario or future, that sandbox, as Paul Graham Raven says, you know, you test the idea to destruction, you know, the idea isn't wrong. You just had an idea about the future, you know, like, and everyone's there to play and to see what works and what doesn't and you know art culture should allow people to to imagine those things and give people a space to talk about them absolutely and i think uh, uh it's refreshing to hear a really positive actually approach about the future an optimistic one it's <laughs> i mean as you said it's either that or despair right <laughs> yeah exactly Actually, I just wanted to ask or comment a question about that, what you Cyrus mentioned now, because it is really an optimistic kind of vision of the future. But then on the other side, I think, you know, when people talk about being realistic, it's always about being pessimistic somehow. You know, mm. we always consider realistic point of view slightly, you know, depressing or, you know, just commenting on bad parts of the society. So I don't know, do you think that this kind of envisioning of the future is then really can be, not is, but can be relevant in a broader public discourse? Uh, or, you know, you think that people, you know, general public might just put it aside as a utopic, optimistic, non-realistic vision of, you know, something that can never be? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, and there's two, two, two separate things that come to mind. One is um, there's a project in Cumbria in the north of the UK, which um, is about rewilding the mountains, because Cumbria is uh, one of the is basically the UK's biggest national park. Um, but the landscape, and this is the landscape of um, is the landscape of Shelley and the British Impressionists who painted Cumbria um, who and you know we in Britain think that it's the the British ideal <laughs> you know what you're actually looking at when you look at the landscape of, of Cumbria is an industrial accident accident from sheep farming there's no trees there's no you know there's there's no wildlife it's all sheep you know denuded grass um, landslides because there isn't enough trees and grass you know to hold the mountainside together. So, you know, all of these problems, basically. Um, so the question is, in terms about being realistic, you know, like the realistic solution is the rewilding of, of, the, of the mountainsides and, you know, at least removing some of the sheep pressure. And it's even worse in Scotland where they want to reintroduce walls, um, which isn't realistic, apparently, you know, <laughs> isn't a realistic thing. But... There's a really interesting project where they have a picture of 
Cum- of of um, one of the mountains in Cumbria with trees on it, and one and a, and a picture of it as it is today, and it's slightly cartoony, you know, illustrated, and they show people which one is Cumbria, and everyone always chooses the one with the trees on it. Because their image of what they think the landscape is is the one with the trees and the mountains, and you know, so and I, I find that really, you know, just speaking about being realistic. Like the, the thing that is most realistic about 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 that picture is actually the fact that it's it's not the real one <laughs> that people pick. And you know, like other realistic things like being like being realistic speaks to realism as opposed to pessimism, you know? Mm. Like um I don't know if, if you have a big park near you. Um one of the like one of the things that people in permaculture talk about is that that one of the reasons why people have s- such bad hay fever is because the grass is cut with blades and it's mismanaged and actually you get less pollen if you let grass grow tall and the grass also changes its physiognomy if uh, if it's eaten by cows and cattle rather than cut by blades so it's like this interesting loop around how we manage park grass causes people to have such bad hay fever and you know a realistic solution to that is to do regenerative farming you know can you imagine in the, your local park and this is a solar punk story you know like trying to explain this to someone can you imagine an urban shepherd who has chickens that sells local eggs you know from the park that, and he just moves around and he moves them every day and the chickens the chickens scratch in the, in the long grass and then behind them are the cows you know, who eat the grass. And, you, and, then, and then behind them, there's some sheep. There aren't many, you know, but they just move around the park every day and they, and they, eat, and they eat the grass, you know, like as a, as a provocation. Like that's, that's actually a realistic future to me. Like I can totally see that happening within 10 years, like in some places that we have like a, a, regenerative, a regenerative method of managing our parks instead of just cutting the grass and shipping it off. Um, and... Yeah, like it's an optimistic realism. You know, it feels real to me. It feels like a thing that could happen. You know, but um, and then on the other side of that, just talking about like like optimistic stories and so on and so forth. One of the projects that I was involved in a few years ago, it was just before the pandemic, was called Citizen Sci-Fi, and it was basically reframing public. I, I forget what the word is. You know, if you're doing public policy and you need to ask people um, for comment on, you know, if there's going to be a new building or if there's, you know, there's money available for the community. I forget what it's called. Consultation. There you go. And rather than doing it as a public, a dry consultation where you ask people to come to a church hall or, or you know, community centre to talk about how the money is going to get spent or, what you know, how wh- where we should spend the money, the project instead did citizen sci-fi and asked people to imagine futures where where the money was spent in in ways that they you know and it was all about stories and they had local artists came and you know were sketching and drawing what could happen to the local park and just that reframing you know that optimistic reframing of using story as you know citizen sci-fi or solar punk specifically but we called it citizen sci-fi rather than, you know, some dry mm. consultation pro- project really worked. Yeah, basically it's a world building, you know, with maybe a vision that has a seed that it can really grow into something and you can involve people in it. Yeah, I'm kind of also asking with the thought of Musicville and, you know, also that locations that we chose for this, kind of production of this piece are somehow riddled with history that is not always positive one. And also, you know, uh, kind of, um, it's just, you know, train of thought, not maybe a question, but, you know, how to consider in the spirit of solar punk something that can be really heavy and, you know, not disregard completely, but rather in the same time, stay optimistic and kind of turn to something, you know, a vision of future that is dedicated to growth and, you know, healing. Yeah. 
Just to interject uh, before you start speaking, Mr. Springett, I would like to remind everyone to keep their microphones muted unless they're talking, just to minimize uh, noise and distractions. Uh, that's it. Go on. Um, it's a tough one, but I think, I mean, Vanessa Andriotti's book, um, Hospicing Modernity, is a really good answer to that. You know, a lot of answers could be found to that kind of train of thinking. Um, her book is basically about like, rather than talking about modernism, she talks about modernity as the condition that we're in. Um, and Vanessa Andriotti is from, the, from Brazil and writes about indigenous ways of thinking and politics and so on and so forth. And one of the things that she points out um, that spe specifically around the Anthropocene um, and, you know, the sort of work and art and discussions that were happening around that particular subject was that to, to the eyes of the global south, the Western world went out and ended everybody else's worlds. And now it's living up to the fact that its own world could be ending kind of thing. And like, that's one of the, the reasons why we're so stuck. Um, I would definitely look at hospicing modernity because there's a line in it where, where, or there's a line of thinking in one of the chapters where we're all someone's ancestors and we all have our own ancestors, you know, and, and that kind of like acknowledgement of things that happened is important and things that they did um, and things that we are doing and things that people after us will have to do for better or worse. You know, there's a really good, you know, a way of thinking um, in that. In, in what did book. you say the author was? I didn't. It's uh, Vanessa. The book is called Hospicing Modernity. Mm -hmm. Vanessa de, Le, de Oliveira Menchan, uh, Manchego. Okay, super. It's one of the best books I read last year. Great uh, answer. Thank you. We have a question in the chat. Uh, Sara asked, do you think that solar panels are the solution for energetic sustainability and also uh, what is your opinion about uh, the electric cars agenda um, yeah i saw that it's a good it's a good question both both are good questions solar panels are like the the, the shift to renewables um andrew Dunn hudson has done a lot of writing and thinking about this and he works at the asu now um through his work in solar punk kind of arrived at asu which is the Arizona State for Sustainability. Um, I think solar panels can provide enough energy for people's needs, but we need to change the way in which we live in order to meet those needs. Um, you know, there's the, the, I think that there used to be a lot of beef <laughs> or, or tensions between degrowth and, and like the solar punks and movement are or like thinking, but you know, they're more, more or less aligned. Like um, I do think that we're going to end up in an energy abundant future. And I think solar panels definitely play a part in that. Um, and, every, you know, but we have to be careful around, you know, in terms of infrastructure, how those solar, solar panels and how the, the grid is built, you know, like the, pa the panels should be on our roofs and it should be our, our electricity. You know, the current model is 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 built around imperial Victorian command and control thinking, you know, and that's, you know, you can't build a, de a, a resilient decentralized society if we store all the energy over there <laughs> and, and, you know, when we need to use it here. As for the electric cars, I think we're in this period where we're still in with as with electric cars themselves, we're in this period where we're still thinking about them as like, it's in the, the reverse of the horse's carriage from like 1910 or whatever, um, because it seems to me that we have the opportunity to totally reconfigure how we move about. And all we're doing is putting batteries in two tons of metal. And it seems crazy to me when, you know, you could have a electric trike or an electric bike that's like way smaller and, you know, like you can have, uh, there's there's electric vehicles in Asia that I've seen that have like roll cages and stuff that can do 60 miles an hour, you know, like, and you're safe, <laughs> like, or safe as can be. If I can just add, uh, I think that here um, the important question is also 
uh, how to build uh, sol solar panels and to gain electricity from them uh, to be that electricity communal that you know because mm -hmm. solar panel on every roof that that's also a catchy idea you know because everyone then should have a own house and own roof you know and it's a uh, and I think, uh, again, it's the same with electric cars agenda. Mm -hmm. Also, the public transport is really the, the main thing here, not the, uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, just... yeah, for sure. We have one more raised hand and one more question. I hope you don't mind uh, me asking this uh, last question. Thanks very much, Jay. Uh, I had a couple thoughts about um, more from a critical perspective, uh, but I think Maria already shared this. My specific question uh, is more about, let's say, the internationalization or globalization of of the solar punk movement itself. And what I'm referring to specifically uh, is uh, this idea of sustainability, and I'm talk I'm I'm coming from India, and so when you talk about sustainability and specifically focusing on something like solar energy, this is uh, a bit of a contradiction because if you support decolonization, uh, you can't support solar energy because it's less viable, more expensive than than coal, for instance, and. Uh, one can't uh, put caps on growth in the developing world based on the developed world standards. Uh, what yep. are your thoughts? Yeah, I agree. Um, I totally get where you're coming from. Um, I personally don't like the word sustainability either, um, just because it's, you know, it's what exactly are we sustaining and perpetuating, you know, through, through those terms. Um, Again, Hospicing Modernity is a great book on this. Um, you know, she talks about this quite a, quite a lot as well. Um, and I think what, one of the one of the challenges that I'd push back on you is around solar panels is that coal is cheaper for now, because you know one of the things that I showed in my talk is is the graph. Like solar panels are a semiconductor technology, and we will continue to make them cheaper. And, and make the the solar cells themselves smaller <laughs> and more efficient. You know, like we're 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 also looking at um, you know, there's like sodium ion batteries which are coming soon rather than lithium, which are three times have three times the capacity and you know like half as cheap. They don't require tearing up the deserts of South America <laughs> to, to 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 make the batteries. You know, so like like things are moving really fast. Um, and you know, like as as cyberpunk was premised on that, you know. The semiconductor getting smaller and smaller solar punk is kind of like imagining futures where solar panels continue to get cheaper and cheaper which you know at least for the next 30 years we know that they will um how cheap they're going to get who knows you know they might be in everything but thanks for your question i hope i answered it Maya, feel free to uh, ask your question, and that will be our last question for today. Uh, and okay, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, it was really inspiring. Um, and uh, yes, I was thinking how it should be actually a part of every PDC course. Uh, my question is actually about uh, the other way of. Uh, seeing things like uh, not solar panels, not electric cars, but uh, what are your thoughts on intersection of solar punk and degrowth, and also uh, the idea of uh, regenerating traditional knowledge and uh, indigenous also knowledge and its connection with the land, which is something actually that wasn't uh, that uh, as I as I understood you didn't talk about a lot, but um i personally believe and uh, i think there are many people who would uh, agree with me that the part of uh, the regeneration of land and society in this term of solar punk is also reconnection with the land reconnection with the earth and also this we can call it spiritual we can call it 
however we want, but um, this kind of reconnection. A bit of a long question, but uh, no, it's yes. re a really good question. A really good question. I think that stories and narratives should be part of a PDC too, like um, you know. And for for I used to joke with Spiral Seed, the guys at Spiral Seed in the UK, who's like, which is the oldest um, permaculture group in the UK, uh, that solarpunk is the propaganda wing for the permaculture movement um in some sense it's a really good question and there's a couple of thoughts that come to mind and that is that um richard perkins the farmer um who is in sweden who runs um uh what's his farm called what is he wrote um He writes about permaculture small farm. Oh, I forget his, the name of his farm. Sorry, my mind is, has gone completely blank. Um, but Richard Perkins is, is, a, is a permaculture farmer, and he's at 59 degrees north in Sweden um, and only has four growing months of the year. And what he's done to his land is just incredible compared to, you know, wh you know where, everywhere else and around him, all of his neighbours. But one of the things that he says is that the biggest narrative shift to get to a regenerative reconnection with the landscape is that farming needs to become a noble profession once again um you know a concept that was kind of destroyed in in the what's known as the white revolution uh, you know the, the turn towards in, in, industrial agriculture and so on and so forth um made by the americans first in south america so and he says that it like before you can even begin to to like re revivify the natural environment in the urban imagination you have to revivify the, the the landscape in the minds of the people who are who are there who are still there farmers need to be proud of what they're doing you know like in america farming is the job that you do if you want to commit suicide you know it's like literally has the, the highest rate the highest rate of suicides than any other profession in in america you know um so there's, there's that part of it is that we need to figure out a way of you know of, of like of of making farming a noble profession and 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 all of that that leads down from it and then there's the question of in like to address the other point about indigeneity obviously it's just my my own opinion um and and like per, one of permaculture's like main things is obviously learning from like indigenous techniques including techniques that we that we have lost in our own culture you know like even 50 years ago in the UK, my grandparents were pickling and canning and, you know, like all of that sort of stuff, which doesn't happen anymore. Um, you know, living seasonally, like to, to respond um, to Sarah's like energy question, like living seasonally is almost the same as like thinking about how we reuse energy as well, like from solar panels, like maybe in the night that we don't have as many lights on. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We don't, we don't use as much energy. And the same as like, it's not, it hasn't been normal to eat strawberries in December if you're in the global north, for example. You know that's not not a normal thing. Um, and the question of land and indigeneity also has also has that that it's a difficult thing to talk about, especially in in Europe, because as soon as you start to talk about those things, the only other people who talk about land and your relationship with land or fascists basically you know it's a tricky it's a really tricky needle to thread and you know people in the in the in the in the climate movement haven't always walked that line or they've thought they've walked a line and, and haven't you know what i mean like it's so so like i i'm in full support of like land back movements and you know and and ind indigenous people like being in charge of their own environment in you know in the rest of the world and within our own communities here in Europe and you know the global north it's it's a it's a different question i mean in the uk the enclosures were were 800 nearly a thousand years ago you know like the so we have to unpick a millennium's worth of 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 cultural inertia or you know cult you know it's it's going to be difficult to build that reconnection But yeah, anyway, I hope it's been useful.
I'm, Thank I'm you really so much for, to... for answering the questions and uh, joining us in this conversation and giving our artists and the public uh, following Musicville something to think about and something to ruminate on. Um, we are very much striving to make Musicville a project that is um, sustainable in a way that we're opening the gates for other artists and for communities and for uh, local people to experience art in a way that is not detrimental and in a way that is open and available and mm. um, free, <laughs> essentially. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much for opening the doors for these conversations within Musicville and as well as outside of it. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for all of your great questions and stuff. If anyone wants to get in touch, you can do so via my blog or whatever. Feel free. <laughs> of course, Any uh, uh, we here hereby urge everyone to uh, follow um, your website. You have a website and a podcast, yeah. uh, so you can write in a chat uh, a link, and we'll exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much, and uh, you can um, view this uh, lecture online uh, on our YouTube channel as well as a uh, previous lecture. Uh, by Anna Blamonova about uh, contemporary opera. We will have more lectures coming, so stay tuned. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And thank you, especially Mr. Springett, for speaking today. No worries. Thank you very much. Uh, goodbye, everyone, and we'll talk well. to you later.